from World News Tonight. War of Choice. Russia's President Putin has lifted the curtains on what may be the beginning of the end, according to global superpowers. With war looming on, countries collectively sanction the country ready for a fight. Global retaliation. From protesters abroad to leaders of the Western world, countries and communities alike reject the thought of invasion on Ukraine. The Kremlin, however, remain determined against all odds. Climate concern. Raging wildfires along with record-breaking snow ravage countries. In an effort to protect against the disasters, Australia steps up the game by advancing preservation efforts. And global icon. Dubai's Museum of the Future leaves a message to the masses with its technical marvels. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with the stark new warnings of the Russian invasion. Many across the globe believe Russia's invasion threat may be the beginning of the end. Despite this, the Kremlin is keen on continuing efforts to further support itself and establish their position in the situation. Tonight, the world again left wondering what Vladimir Putin has planned. We know what he thinks. Today on television, again saying Ukraine could end the crisis by renouncing its ambitions to join NATO. And his hour-long unscripted appearance last night, a more extreme echo of speeches he has made for 15 years, railing against NATO in a famous 2007 speech, stunning Western leaders, just this past July, writing Russians and Ukrainians were one people, a single, whole. And we know what he's capable of, with thousands of Russian troops on Ukraine's border. Tonight, Russia's lawmakers approving the use of force. President Putin so far apparently undeterred by threats of sanctions and dismissing criticisms. While Russian President Vladimir Putin readies himself for what many call a war of choice, countries around the world have decided that enough is enough, as major Western superpowers collectively sanction the country, along with supporters across the globe protesting against the invasion. We have other than the world news special mm. correspondent Malsha Patidraja from Kursk in Russia for more. Malsha? Yes, Anuradi. U.S. President Joe Biden announced new sanctions in retaliation for Russia, recognizing two breakaway regions of Ukraine and sending troops there, adding to Western efforts to stop what they fear in the, is the beginning of a full-scale invasion. He has also stated that all possible meetings between the two countries have effectively been cancelled as well. Meanwhile, more countries are joining the retaliation against Russia. This includes Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau who added to the sanctions as he sternly stated that Putin will not come through this better. Meanwhile, dozens of civilians from the Ukraine's eastern Donbass region have been evacuated to the Russian city of kamensk shatinsky as tensions continue to escalate along the border. Along with diplomatic tensions, citizens around the world have also taken action. Like in Paris, where about 100 pro-Ukraine demonstrators get gathered in front of the Russian embassy to call help from France and Europe to defend Ukraine. Similar visuals were observed in Berlin as well as multiple other countries. Many called for an end to the rising tensions and invasion efforts. Despite this, the Kremlin has insisted on defending itself against Western powers. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent, Malsha Raja from Kursk in Russia. It seems Russia's drastic actions have had a domino effect on the functions of the rest of the world as a controversial gas pipeline, Nord Stream 2, has been frozen in development, putting an end to the project before it even began. It's been contentious since the day it was proposed. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline was due to bring gas from Russia to Western Europe, but now it faces a shutdown before it's even begun operations. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said Tuesday that he was putting its approval on ice. He says the situation has to be reassessed in light of Russia's actions in Ukraine. I have asked the German economy ministry today to withdraw the report on the analysis of energy supply guarantees from the regulator. 
It sounds technical, but it's the required procedure so that there can be no certification of the pipeline now. The decision is sure to please Washington. Successive US administrations have opposed the pipeline, saying it makes Europe dangerously dependent on Russian supplies. Nord Stream 2 was also strongly opposed by Ukraine, which earns transit fees from the current line running through its territory. Now Scholz says Germany's economy ministry will ensure that the project cannot be certified for use, though that may leave Berlin with a headache. Europe's largest economy depends on Russia for around half of its energy needs. Even so, the economy ministry says gas supplies can be secured without Nord Stream 2. Meanwhile, the European Union agreed to new sanctions on Russia that will blacklist more politicians, lawmakers and officials, ban EU investors from trading in Russian state bonds and target imports and exports with separatist entities. We have other day on the World News special correspondent Prashani Rodrigo from Helsinki in Finland for more. Prashani. Yes, Anuradi. However, EU foreign ministers chose not to sanction Russian President Vladimir Putin. The EU's foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell said following a meeting in Paris. Borrell said Russia's formal recognition of two breakaway regions in the eastern Ukraine was an unacceptable breach of Ukraine's sovereignty. The package of sanctions includes all members of the lower house of the Russian parliament who voted in favor of the recognition of the breakaway regions, freezing any assets they have in the EU and banning them from the traveling to the bloc. It was not immediately clear when the sanctions would take effect, but diplomats expect them in the coming hours or days when names and details will be made public. Borrell said some targeted individuals and entities were in Russia's defense, banking and financial sector. Banks involved in financing separatist activities in eastern Ukraine would also be targeted. The EU had repeatedly said it was ready to impose massive consequences on Russia's economy if Moscow invaded Ukraine, but has also noted that given the EU's close energy and trade ties to Russia, it wanted to move in stages. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Prashani Rodrigo from Helsinki in Finland. Climate calamities continue to occur as wildfires in Argentina's north have progressed to spread through the province of Corrientes, causing major damage to its ecosystems and infrastructure. The growing front lines of a mounting catastrophe. This is the province of Corrientes in northern Argentina, where 8,000 square kilometers have been consumed by wildfires. Since mid-January, the province has seen some 10% of its surface area go up in smoke. This is atypical. We've never seen something like this. We're really overwhelmed. Corrientes lies on the country's northern border with Paraguay. The fires are threatening the province's Ibera National Park, Argentina's largest wetland and one of its most varied ecosystems. The largely agricultural region surrounding it has been stricken by drought for more than a year, linked to the second consecutive La Nina, a climate phenomenon that brings drier weather to central Argentina. Extreme heat and high winds have made fighting the fires that much harder. It's bad, very bad. Those are the cards we've been dealt over the past few years. Climate change has created these huge fires that are very hard to control, not just in Argentina, but all around the world. Environmental advocates say short-sighted development models, intensive farming and cattle ranching on wetlands have also contributed to the fire's severity. Firefighters are hoping that thunderstorms forecast for later this week will give them an edge in getting the blazes under control. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Despite the controversy surrounding former U.S. President Donald Trump, it seems his supporter base has only kept climbing, as his latest app, Truth Social, has exceeded expectations of ratings on release. 
Shares of the Special Acquisition Company, or SPAC, responsible for ex-President Donald Trump's new social media app, jumped on Tuesday after launching over the weekend. According to Apptopia, Truth Social was downloaded more than 170,000 times since its launch late Sunday, topping downloads on Apple's App Store. The SPAC was also trending high on investor-focused social media site StockTwits, indicating interest from retail traders. Shares of Digital World Acquisition Corp. initially jumped 14 percent to a level last seen in October when the blank check firm announced a deal to publicly list Trump Media and Technology Group, the venture behind Truth Social. But by midday Tuesday, shares had given back more than half of those gains. Wall Street's top financial regulators are investigating Trump's $1.25 billion deal to float Trump Media and Technology Group on the stock market, according to a filing from December. Other stocks linked to Trump also whipsawed on Tuesday. Shares of Funware, which was hired by Trump's 2020 re-election campaign to build an app, initially climbed 11 percent but then turned negative at one point. CF Acquisition Corp. 6, the SPAC behind video platform Rumble, which will deliver video and streaming for Truth Social, started the session up about 3.5 percent but was down more than 7 percent by midday. Meanwhile, shares of Twitter and Facebook parent Meta Platforms, which both banned Trump from their services following last year's attack on the U.S. Capitol, fell along with the rest of tech in Tuesday's session. Colombia's high court decriminalized of abortion of up to 24 weeks of pregnancy in a landmark ruling for the majority Catholic country, one of only a few in Latin America that currently allow the procedure. For pro-choice activists, it's news worth spreading. The outside of Colombia's constitutional court lit up with jubilation as hundreds celebrate the legalization of abortion during the first 24 weeks. It's such an immense happiness because we have finally achieved what women through history fought for. This is historic. We finally succeeded in having them allow us to decide over our bodies. While pro-choice activists danced, anti-abortion protesters prayed. The feminists believe that this is a step forward for women, when in reality this is a step backward because the fight for women's rights doesn't include murdering others. Earlier inside the court, judges had voted five against four to decriminalize the procedure. It reversed a decision taken in the same court back in 2006. Under that ruling, abortion was only allowed if the health of a woman was in danger, if the fetus had a fatal condition, or when a pregnancy resulted from rape or incest. Anyone else who had an abortion or who helped a woman obtain one faced prison sentences ranging from 16 months to four and a half years. Colombia now joins a handful of Latin American countries to have decriminalized the procedure. Momentum for the legalization of abortion has grown in recent years. This in what is a historically conservative region that is dominated by the Catholic faith. Activists hope the move to decriminalize will make abortion access safer. A 2014 study by the Colombian Health Ministry estimates that 70 women die each year from unsafe abortions. We have some good news for you. Over in Zambia, innovative minds are turning redundant waste into a precious source of energy. A kickstart company has begun successfully turning tires that litter the back street of the country into fuel for vehicles. You might think these old tires are useless, but one Zambian company is getting them back on the road as fuel. Mulenga Mulenga, chief executive of Central African Renewable Energy Corporation, says they are cleaning up the environment by converting waste into energy. Mulenga says they are currently processing 1.5 tonnes of waste, which also includes plastic containers, to make 600 to 700 litres of diesel and gasoline per day. Now, that's hardly enough to dent Zambia's mountains of rubbish or its $1.4 billion annual fuel import bill. But energy analyst Johnson Chikwanda says any initiative that reduces import dependence needs to be supported. Mulenga's company is now seeking investment of $60 million. That's to raise output to 400 tonnes of diesel, 125 tonnes of petrol and 30 tonnes of liquefied petroleum gas. 
all, he says, at roughly half the cost of imported fuel. However, just how green such projects are is a subject of debate. Plastic and rubber are made of long chains of hydrocarbons that can be heated and broken down into something resembling crude oil. The process involves burning waste rubber and plastic and mixing it with a catalyst. From a climate change perspective, that takes a lot of energy, and the products still release carbon dioxide when burned. However, waste management remains a problem in Zambia, and people continue to use fuel. Supporters of such initiatives argue it's better if it comes from recycled waste. As France's presidential election approaches, some aspiring candidates say they are still striving to collect the 500 signatures from elected officials required to join the ballot for the first round on April 10th. Centre-right Mayor David Lidznauer of the Republicans' Party and supporter of their candidate Valérie Pécresse says he has decided to sponsor far-left contender Jean-Luc Mélenchon. He thinks it's only right he's able to run. I think it's important to make a point to show that the system is not worth supporting and that we need to protect democratic and republican free speech. The La France Insoumise leader has only received 370 signatures so far. With less than two weeks before the deadline, only six candidates have managed to reach the required tally of 500. Three of the main contenders are concerned, such as left-wing candidate Christiane Taubira, who has only 86 signatures. Whilst far-right figures Eric Zemmour and Marine Le Pen are also struggling. It's a situation which is terrifying for our democracy. I've never been so worried. It's a situation which means these runners will need to reconsider their priorities. Zemmour cancelled a trip to the island of Réunion to concentrate on the task. At each election, appeals to change the rules have come to the fore but a candidate has yet to be barred from running due to the system. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. One person has been detained and an investigation opened to determine the cause of an explosion that kills scores of people at an informal gold mining site in Burkina Faso. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro said that two military personnel were killed and two others injured during a helicopter crash in the western state of Lara. Cambodia will begin inoculating children from three to five years old amid a rise in daily cases of the Omicron variant of COVID-19. It was stated that since Omicron hit the kingdom in mid-December last year, over 20% of the infected have been children aged five or younger. Roads and streets were inundated by widespread flooding in Australia's Sunshine Coast after torrential rainfall pummeled southeast Queensland. Flood water rose to 1.4 metres in some parts of Sunshine Coast, covering roads and stranding vehicles as rescue personnel were deployed to help with search and rescue. Japan's Emperor Naruhito marked his 62nd birthday in a scaled-down ceremony amid COVID-19 pandemic. Australia has joined the effort on protecting the planet's most delicate areas. A massive sum has been put forward in order to allow a complete surveillance of Antarctica via drone technology. The initiative is expected to allow for better conservation of the region. Flying over penguins and glaciers in Antarctica over the next 10 years will be Australian-funded drones and helicopters. Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced the 578 million US dollar surveillance program on Tuesday. It will put eyes on Antarctica to monitor everything from climate change to security concerns. It comes as China steps up its presence in the frozen continent. What we have to protect against is threats to Antarctica. That's what this is about. And we protect against those threats through our scientific research. Uh, through the building of our understanding, uh, through the mapping, cap mapping capabilities that are being put in place, um, by ensuring that we can go to places which we've never been able to go before. Integrated sensors and cameras will feed back real-time information. And four new helicopters with a range of over 300 miles will be purchased. Australia claims about 42% of Antarctica and operates four research stations there. 
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you've missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with a look into Dubai's egg-shaped, pillar-free Museum of the Future, packed with innovative technical marvels. Thank you for watching. Good night.